And the other reason, uh, apart from the Washington consensus, that these leaders were able to gain power, these Chavez and Morales and the rest of it, is of course because of this long history since the Monroe Doctrine in the 1830s of military interventions by the United States military and dirty wars and assassinations and coups and all the rest of it, right? A long and very shameful history, which I'm sure many of you know. And this ha has created a kind of latent anti-Americanism that bubbles up every so often. And that combined with this anti-free market sentiment in Latin America, and it produced this very heady uh, populist brew. Now, Latin America is often described, or South America, to be more specific, is often described in terms of two lefts, two camps of the left. Uh, essentially, the radicals, who I've described, and the moderates, which people normally uh, use to mean Brazil. <laughs> Brazil are, as opposed to is, the moderates. And then you have other countries like Argentina, which, you know, it's kind of hard to tell what they're doing any day. They're so uh, madcap and chaotic and, and uh, a bit bonkers at times. Um, but they're kind of sometimes radical, sometimes moderate. They're not ever quite sure what they are. Uh, I think that's got worse since uh, Cristina Fernandez took over as president. But I think once you uh, strip away the rhetoric, because a lot of that division is based on rhetoric, who can shout the loudest? Forget about that, cut out all the noise, and just look at what they actually do. What actually defines Chavez and his friends is economic nationalism or resource nationalism, whatever you want to call it. And as I've said, that's a reaction against the Washington Consensus. That's bringing the state back in the economy. That's raising taxes on foreign investors. And that has been on display in Brasilia as well as in Caracas. So I'll give you two quick examples. The first one is from the oil industry. Uh, in the 1990s, Brazil uh, ended the Petrobras's monopoly. Petrobras is the state energy company in Brazil. And they opened the industry up to foreign investment. But if you look in the past couple of years, oil policy in Brazil has become much more nationalistic. So they've restricted uh, foreign corporations to secondary roles in most projects. And I'm sure many of you are aware there's a huge de offshore deposit of oil in Brazil. They call it the sub-salt deposit because it's underneath a layer of salt. Very hard to access. There was a big spill there recently, Chevron facility. And if you want to, if you're a foreign investor and you want to invest in that sub-salt deposit, you have to go into a joint venture with Petrobras, the state company, and they have to have at least 30% of the arrangement and they have to be the controlling operator. So in that sense you see an expanded role for, for Petrobras and there are lots of other examples of that as I'm sure you know related to, to the big share offering that Petrobras had uh, last year. But I don't want to compare the two. I, I just think the United States should, should back Brazil. I think it would be a huge important gesture, something very practical. And you know the beautiful thing about this in the kind of age of the sort of, you know, the age when we're talking about sort of Ron Paul debate about how much foreign policy costs, it's free. <laughs> it costs nothing. A wonderful kind of piece of foreign policy. Um, free foreign policy is something you don't get in many places, but you get it in Latin America. But more importantly than that, uh, I think more generally, the US needs to get used to the idea that you have to deal with countries that don't agree with you. 